welcome back to another episode of Finn's Chats. I'm the Finn's. I'm going to be going over at UFC 271. I'm going to break down the whole main card, the prelims, the early prelims. I'm going to pick out fights here and there that I think I'm going to thoroughly enjoy. I got my coffee. I'm hyped up. Hopefully, you're hyped too by buying a new... No, it's not an advertisement, but this is where I think the advertisement would go once I get big enough. Right here, this little slot in my intro thing. All right, let's get into the breakdown. Go! Okay, first fight in the main card is Jeremiah Wells taking on Mike Matheta. So Mike Matheta is 3-0, so we're not going to really talk about him. There's not really much to talk about. He's 3-0. First UFC fight. I'm not sure how he got this fight. Maybe it was a short notice fight. Who knows? But then we got Jeremiah Wells. He's 9-2 and two and 35 years old. You can say he's the next UL Romero. Old? 35 is not too old, but it's older than Kamaru Uzma. It makes you think, okay, maybe it's a little old. And he's only had one UFC fight. It was a KO in the second round. He was fighting for Cage Fury Championship before that. And before that, he was fighting for a CFFC. And he was doing pretty good for himself. So I guess the UFC finally found him. And they're like, hey, you know what, Jeremiah? Come on over. We'll give you a nice 3 0 little scrub. And then if you can beat him, you can keep moving up the ranking. So I think Jeremiah Wells might be a prospect to look out for. And they threw him right in the first fight, the early prelims. So give me Jeremiah Wells here. Okay, next fight in the prelims is Sergey Morozov versus Douglas Silva Diandraj. So considering I don't know either of these fighters, I don't know anything about either fighter, and their records aren't jumping off the page to me, I'm just going to go on to the next fight. Sergey Morozov. He has a name that might make me think he's good at MMA. May. So maybe I'm going to go with him. Okay, so this next fight's very interesting. We have AJ Dobson taking on Jacob Malkoon. So AJ Dobson just came off of a contender series win back in September. He rear naked choked somebody in the first round. That was very impressive. And before that, he was on a five-fight win streak outside of the promotion. And he was actually in five different fighting promotions, which is actually wild. KO submission, KO, TKO, and another TKO. Savage. Jacob Malkoon, on the other hand, is 5-1. He comes from Australia, you know, New Zealand. That's where Adesanya is from. So I think they're going to try to stack this car with as many Australian New Zealanders as they possibly can. Yes, I know New Zealand is different from Australia, and Adesanya is from New Zealand. But, like, it's, it's, you know, it's like, it's, it, do you really know the difference? Like, is that racist? I don't think it's racist. I might cut this out of the video. Anyway, Jacob Malkoon's had two fights. One against Phil Hawes. He got knocked out. And that was when we thought Phil Hawes was good. So, you know, cut him some slack. And then he also beat Abdul Razak Al-Hassan. It took me five tries to say that name correctly. He was able to forego the heavy hits of Abdul. So maybe he can do the same against AJ Dobson. But I also want to see, you know, undefeated fighters keep being undefeated. So I'm going to go for AJ Dobson here. Okay, this next fight is a pretty easy gimme. We have Carlos Olberg taking on Fabio Charant. So Carlos Olberg, he's on Adesanya his team he trains with him so obviously he's going to be on this card and Olberg's last fight he got utterly destroyed by Kennedy Nezachekwu that was a fight of the night that was a crazy fight because Carlos actually had the upper hand in the first couple rounds but then he completely gas tanked himself was fighting with his hands down and then got clocked so that's not going to work against basically any real fighter he did really good in the contender series he knocked out whoever he fought and he's going to fight Fabio Tarant so I'm not even sure why this guy is even in the UFC he's had two UFC fights he lost by submission to Alonzo Manyfield he lost by KO to William Knight. Both fighters who are actually pretty good, so it's not really fair. But they're gonna give him Carlos Olberg, who's coming off his first career loss. And Carlos Olberg's again this guy who's coming off two savage losses. Whoever loses this one is probably on their way out, but whoever wins this one will probably stay around for a couple more fights. So I'm gonna take Carlos Olberg. He's very handsome. He looks like handsome Squidward. So how can you not put your money on a guy that looks like handsome Squidward? Okay, next up we have everybody's favorite fighter, Alexander the Great Hernandez, taking on Renato Moicano. So Alexander Hernandez, ever since that fight with Cowboys to he's been on like an up and down kind of career swing he won his next fight against Trinaldo he lost to Drew Dober he beat Chris Gutischmacher he lost to Thiago Moises and then he beat Mike Breeden recently in the first round by a KO so he's kind of like up and down up and down so they're gonna give him a fighter that's also up and down and Reynado Moicano he comes from Brazil so you already know that jiu-jitsu game is fire he won his last fight oh would you look at that by rear naked choke the Jai Herbert he lost to Rafael Vazir but everybody loses to Rafael Vazir he's fought some heavy hitters Chen <laughs> the Korean zombie Jose Aldo Cub Swanson, Calvin Qatar, Brian Ortega, Jeremy. This guy's been around the block in bantamweight. So against Alexander Hernandez, this is going to be a great fight to see if Hernandez is like a fish in the water or if he's going to actually evolve into a, you know, a koi fish and get his own little pond in bantamweight. I do think Alexander Hernandez has changed his game enough to win this fight, but Renato Moicano is not to be slept on. He is 15 and 4. He's no scrub. So I might take Renato by submission here 
Although I think Alexander Hernandez can squeak out the decision. Okay, moving up the card, we have Leo Mana Martinez taking on Ronnie Lawrence. I don't really have much input to say on this fight. Both fighters, you know, they haven't really done anything to show like greatness yet, even though their records are pretty fire, nine and two and seven and one. The only person I really know from this fight is Leo Mana Martinez, and I only know him because he got submitted in his contender series debut by Draco Rodriguez. But since then, he's on a three fight winning streak and he did lose his last one by a split decision, but I'm gonna take him in this fight. We're going in blind, boys. We're just Leo Mana, Mar Leo Mana Martinez, baby. Okay, next fight on the card to start the prelims, William Nightmare Knight taking on Maxim Grisham. So on the surface, you might be like, oh, William Knight's getting another can toss at him. What else is new? UFC loves building stars. They're gonna keep tossing cans at him until he has a juicy enough record to fight top 15. That is not the case here. So William Knight is a nightmare. He is really good and he's really jacked. So he might be on steroids, more plates, more dates, a video on that and i do believe him so he's probably on steroids he probably injects 10,000 serums of horse manure into his veins every night and eats consumes buck buckets of nails to keep his protein i don't know anyways this fight is really good because maxim grishin is no pushover yes he did lose his last fight to dustin jacoby but dustin jacoby's also really good he has a couple of knockouts on his record he has a couple of draws he has a couple of submissions so maxim grishin you know he likes the control and the clinch but he also packs big power in his hands just like william knight the way i see this fight going though is a typical maxim grishin fight there's a lot of top control there's a lot of clinch control there's a lot of knees and elbows and stuff like that in the clinch and it's going to come down to a very close decision just like almost all of Grisham's fights. I do have William Knight here, although Max and Grisham is a dark horse underdog pick right here. This fight card really has a bunch of fights that could headline a fight night, but they aren't good enough to be like co-mains or on the main card. So a perfect example is this next fight. Alex Perez taking on Matt Schnell. You know, the flyweight division is popping recently. Ever since Henry Cejudo fought TJ Dillashaw, it seems like the flyweight division got like the do -do 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 that it needed because now it was on the brink of being extinct, but now it's like popping and like more like any other division in the UFC. So Alex Perez, he's coming off, you know, Davison Figueredo said, admitted him in basically two minutes because he went for a takedown and he couldn't get it and then he got caught in the guillotine gg for alex perez he has a lot of good wins on his resume he has tko submissions tko submissions not really a lot of decisions let me go to the matt chanel side yes he is coming off a loss to rogerio bonterine who actually missed weight for that fight so maybe that has something to do with it but he also has a win against tyson nam jordan espinoza louis smoka murderers row of flyweights that aren't in the top 10 matt chanel has fought and he has made it very close whether he won or lost lost he made a close fight so this is a perfect fight to bolster somebody up to the top five in the flyweight division i'm gonna take alex perez here i think it was a fluke that he lost to figueredo he got caught in the guillotine you know what happens to me in jujitsu i get caught in somebody's flying arm rear naked triangle knee bar calf slicer knee knee crank and i'm like oh shit maybe i shouldn't have done that but in a in a fight you lose and nobody remembers you so there's a difference between you I'm taking Alex Perez here. Okay, this is actually quite a funny matchup. We have Roxanne Modafferi taking on my queen, King Casey O'Neill. Casey O'Neill is a no. She is undefeated. She is not losing this fight. UFC has a tendency to throw Roxanne Modafferi at any up-and-comer in the flyweight women's division. And Roxanne either beats them, which is not good, like she did to Macy Barber. Everybody's, oh, Macy Barber, gonna be the youngest champion ever, even beating John Jones because he was a champion at 20 one or whatever no that macy barber bam acl torn hype train demolished by roxanne modafferi but casey o'neill i think is different she's a no in each fight she has basically just brought her opponent to the mat got in top control and started landing bombs from the top until the referee's like okay that's enough king casey please stop i am on the casey o'neill hype train she will be roxanne modafferi here i'm pretty sure this is roxanne's retirement fight so she might go out swinging you know she might land a couple blows but casey o'neill is the king She's not losing this fight. Maybe give her our number one contender match shot. Who knows? She's very close. King Casey all the way. Take my money. Okay, moving up the car, we have Andre Arlovsky taking on Jared Vendera. So I'm not even sure why this fight is here, why this fight is even happening, how Andre Arlovsky is even still fighting in the UFC, but it's here, and I'm going to break it down really quickly. So Andre Arlovsky has a tendency recently to fight up-and-comer up, up and comer heavyweights, 
and he brings him to the test. He either wins by decision or he gets brutally KO'd like he did against Tom Aspinall. That was pretty sad. But Andre Arlovsky still got it. He still racks up wins. He's in the UFC still for a reason. Darren Van Dara, on the other hand, he also has a similar win-loss, win-loss, win-loss. So I'm not sure what there is to gain out of making this fight. Like, does the winner fight somebody in the top 15? Well, Andre Arlovsky is 80,000 years old. He can fight a pterodactyl and it would still be the same thing like it doesn't even make sense it doesn't even matter so this fight in my opinion does not matter it's gonna be a heavyweight slugfest i guess gotta respect orlovsky I'll, I'll take orlovsky why not okay this next fight's actually pretty interesting we have bobby green taking on nasrat haskarat if i said that right give me a hundred bucks because that was very hard to say but anyways nasrat his last fight he fought dan hooker and dan hooker put on an absolute wrestling grappling clinic on him and nasrat lost by decision which was fair both were fighting on very short notice i mean they made the fight a long time in advance they didn't really know if they were gonna fight they had to do visa issues they're both from out of the country so when they came back in it was a whole big thing they didn't have a lot of time for training so it would cut Nazrat a break but Nazrat's whole career has basically been four fight winning streak he fights a big name and loses recently four fight winning streak for Drew Dober lost recently two fight winning streak fights Dan Hooker loses like right when he's about to crack into the top 10 top 15 he loses and that's not really against Nasrat he's the UFC just has a lot of top tier talent on the other side of the coin we have Bobby Green he is coming off of a knockout win against Ally Quinta and nobody knocks out Ally Quinta maybe he should go back to selling real estate because that was a very hard fight to watch he lost to Rafael Fazeev, but that fight was also considered one of the fight of the year contenders. It was a lot of slugfesting, a lot of back and forth, basically everything you can ask for from an MMA fight. He lost to Tiago Moises, which is a little concerning because Tiago Moises is like the fighter that you have to beat to get into the top 15. Like Islam beat him, Joel Alvarez beat him. He seems like the gatekeeper of the top 15 and Bobby Crean could not beat him. So this is a perfect fight for both guys because then the winner of this will probably crack into the top 15 regardless and fight better competition. And they both been in the UFC for quite a while like multiple years I never even knew who Nas Wright was until he fought Dan Hooker I look at his resume and he's fought since 2016 in the UFC I'm like what the I must be an MMA casual because I did not know this and Bobby Green's been around for even longer since 2013 yes granted I know who Bobby Green is and he has a similar record to Nas Wright in the fact that he fights low names and he wins he fights big names and he loses so perfect fight for both men I'm gonna take Nas Wright here Cut him some slack for losing to Dan Hooker. Bobby Green is pretty good, but give me Nasrat. Also, what a name, Nasrat. Okay, not sure why this fight is the main fight on the main card outside of the top three, but we have Kyler Phillips taking on Marcello Rojo. So Kyler Phillips, he's a big name, a big up and coming prospect. He was on three fight winning streak in the UFC. They were trying to hype him up to the top. They gave him Rally and Pava. Who else did they give Rally and Pava to? Oh, right, Sugar Sean O'Malley. Sugar Sean O'Malley spanked him. But Rally and Pava was able to beat Kyler Phillips. Rally and Pava is kind of like the guy, like basically for bantamweight, as Tiago Moises is to lightweight. So you beat him, you crack into the top 15. Kyler Phillips was unable to beat him, therefore he's not cracked in the top 15. So the UFC is like, okay, we don't want to derail the high train completely from Kyler Phillips. So let's give him somebody lesser known like Marcelo Rojo. So Marcelo Rojo is 16 and 7. He's coming off a TKO loss from Charles Jourdain in early 2021. He has a lot of KOs on his record. He has a lot of submissions on his record. He has a lot of KO losses on his record. And he has a lot of submission losses on his record. He is 16 and 7, like I previously said. Tyler Phillips is a heavy favorite here. I think he's going to win. I think they put him on the main card for a reason. And that's because they want to get his name big in the bright lights. And what better way to do that by feeding him a can like Marcelo Rojo. So this is easily can versus star matchup. I'm taking the star. Give me Kyler Phillips. Sprinkle him in the parlay please okay this next fight has to be the memeiest number one contenders fight i've ever seen we have Derek brunson who nobody thought would ever get his way back to a number one contenders fight after being brutally ko'd by adesanya most knockdowns in a single round in a single ufc fight in history and he's taking on jared cannonier the killer gorilla he's 14 and 5 he used to be a light heavyweight he moved down the middleweight and ever since then he's been sparking people yes he lost to Robert Whitaker, but where's Robert Whitaker right now? Oh, he's in the main event of this card. Oh, did he fight Adesanya yet? No! So that's why Adesanya has been really rooting for Cannonier to win, because he doesn't want to spark Brunson again. So I remember Brunson, he fought Edmund Shabazian a couple years ago on a main event at UFC Fight Night. Heavy underdog, Edmund was supposed to win, and what happened? He utterly spanked Edmund. And ever since then... Brunson has been on a savage winning streak, and he's been doing the same thing to opponents that are up in the up and coming. Like, like he beat Kevin Holland. Nobody thought that he would beat Kevin Holland. He wrestled him for five rounds and won. And then he fought Darren Till. Nobody thought he would beat Darren Till. And then what happened? He wrestled him for a couple rounds, submitted him, and won. He has big names on his resume, but I don't think his style of fight 
is suited for the upper echelon of middleweight, which he will find out soon enough. I don't think he can wrestle Vittori, I don't think he can wrestle Costa, and I certainly don't think he can wrestle Adesanya, and I certainly don't think he can wrestle Cannoneer, which is why he's also the underdog here. Every fight Brunson fights, he's the underdog in. So Cannoneer on the other side, every power in his hands. He was able to brutally just destroy and run through Jack Hermanson, who's a ground specialist, ran through him in, I think, one or two rounds, completely decimated him. And yes, he lost to Whitaker. He almost got KO'd by Whitaker for a split second. But that's also Robert Whitaker, so I'm not going to throw too much blame on Cannoneer for that. But I am rooting for Cannoneer, because Cannoneer, Adesanya, very intriguing matchup. They were talking about Adesanya versus Usman, or Whitaker versus Usman for the double champ fight. But I think if Cannoneer wins, it's very clear who the next number one contender is. It's Jared Cannoneer. I'm taking Jared Cannoneer here, because I don't, you know, Derek Brunson, who, he's just a meme. Like, no one, if you put your money on Derek Brunson, you are a meme, and you deserve to lose your money. Cannoneer, all the way. Thank you. Okay, so before this co-main event was announced, UFC 271 was a little lackluster. It was missing that big punch to get the people going like, okay, maybe I should tune into this card. And this is the perfect fight to tune into this card. We have Derek Lewis taking on Tai Shui Tui Vasa. What a crazy fight. This is going to be a one-round slobber knocker. They're both knockout artists. Derek Lewis, he recently just destroyed Chris Dawkins or Kyle Dawkins or the whole Dawkins family. Who knows? And then Tai Tui Vasa is on a savage KO win streak. Not even win streak. KO win streak. This is the perfect matchup for both guys. Both guys do not like to grapple. They do not like to clinch. They do not like to wrestle. They do like to throw big fist. So I can see this fight playing out like Ninganu Lewis, where they both just stand there and do nothing. Praying that doesn't happen. Praying Derek Lewis learned from that fight and he can go out there and put on a slugfest with Tai Tuivasa. I know the Nelk boys will be in attendance. Tai Tuivasa is a big Nelk fan, supposedly. I don't know. He drinks beer out of Steve Will Do His Shoes. So I guess that makes him a Nelk fan. I guess that makes me a Nelk fan, because I do that sometimes. I mean, you gotta, you gotta get a little crazy. But nonetheless, I don't think this jump in competition is right for Tai Tuivasa, although this is the perfect competitor for him to go against. I'm taking Derek Lewis here simply because of what he did to Chris Dawkins, because Chris Dawkins, similar position to Tai Tuivasa, who's fighting the lower echelon of heavyweight, he makes a big jump to Derek Lewis, gets brutally destroyed. So I think Tai Tuivasa, you know, fighting the lower echelon of heavyweight, is coming off a Greg Hardy knockout. Like Greg Hardy? And somebody like some other guy that I can't even name? He's not fighting top 10 guys, and now he's going to fight like the number two, number three ranked heavyweight in the world. I think that's a GG for Tai Tuivasa. It was fun while it lasted. I'm going to be rooting for him, but I'm taking Derek Lewis here, of course. And boom, bada bing. That brings us to the main event. Israel Adesanya versus Robert Whitaker. Now, this is very similar to Kamaru Usman versus Colby Covington because Colby Covington is basically leagues above the rest of the division. But he's also a league still below Usman. Robert Whitaker is leagues above the middleweight division, but still a league below Israel Adesanya. So the only way Adesanya loses is if Whitaker activates his ground game, because I simply don't think he's going to outstrike Adesanya. Adesanya is a kickboxing legend. He's very good at counters, as you saw in their first fight where he brutally KO'd Whitaker. He also almost got the KO at the end of the first round. Whitaker was on his ass. Bell rang. He's like, all right, bet, bet, bet. Comes out very next round, gets destroyed. So I do not see the fight playing out the same way. Since then, Whitaker has said he's changed his mindset. He's on a nice winning streak. He even beat Cannoneer. He beat Kelvin Gastelum. He beat Darren Till. He's beaten some big names to get back to this rematch. I'm going to take Robert Whitaker here. I know it's a hot take. I know I just said that Whitaker can't win if he just tries to outclass Adesanya on the feet. However, I do think Whitaker is more hungry than Adesanya. You know, when you're a champion and you fight and you fight and you fight and you defend and you defend and you defend, eventually you're going to get to a point where you're like, okay, this is whack. I'm not hungry anymore. Even Habib said he wasn't hungry anymore. That led to his retirement. But some champions keep going until they lose. I'm taking Whitaker here. He's the underdog. He's too much of an underdog for my liking. Uh, actually, it's great for my liking because it's going to make me more money. I think Vegas really screwed off these lines here. I'm taking Robert Whitaker. Screw Israel Adesanya, the style of bender. I do love him. But Robert Whitaker, Bobby Knuckles, you know, the Red Savage Sonic character. How can you not move for this guy? He's in Skyrim. He has a voice acting role in Skyrim. Give me Robert Whitaker. He has savage tattoos. Look at those things. They're stars. He is a star. He's going to be the newly crowned champion at UFC 271. You heard it, you heard it here first from the fans on Finn's chat. <laughs> Thank you.
you for getting to another episode of Finn's Chats. I did my little review on UFC 271. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you don't think my takes are too spicy. I did throw in some underdog money lines, some heavy favorite under the lines. But at the end of the day, Robert Whitaker will be your new middleweight champion come Saturday. Yes, I said Nagano last pay-per-view. Yes, I said Charles Oliveira the pay-per-view before that. And both of them were underdogs. And this is another underdog. Give me Whitaker. Have a great day. You said.